afternoon to everyone and welcome to our Mozilla mornings at two in the afternoon in Brussels. And no, we haven't gone mad. Uh, we have a, a guest joining us from the US where it is morning and after all, it's always morning somewhere. So uh, I hope everyone's ready for a great chat. We've only got an hour today and we're going to look at the DSA. Of course, many times we've talked about this before, but today we're going to look at auditing and uh, give the tires a kick and look under the hood of what the possibilities are. So let us kick off. I'm going to get um, Owen from uh, Mozilla. Owen Bennett, who's Senior Policy uh, Manager at Mozilla Corporation, is going to kick things off and tell us why this has been organized today before we jump straight into the discussion. Thank you, Jen, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in to what is the second installment of Mozilla Mornings in 2021. And we're humbled that like, despite the challenges of, of Zoom fatigue, that you consider our event to be worthy of your time. And of course, we'll endeavor to make sure that that is time well spent. Um, so as Jen mentioned, today's event is going to be looking specifically at Article 28 of the DSA, which deals with, uh, with third party auditing. And at Mozilla, we, we consider that this, this regime, this auditing provision, can be quite an effective pillar of the DSA's like, next generation approach to what oversight looks like in the tech sector. And of course, like specialist auditors, they can provide a, an oversight baseline that, that complements the work of regulators and also frees up and gives more space for public interest researchers to focus on the things and the, the hidden harms which might otherwise go unseen in the platform ecosystem. And of course, the discourse around this topic is, is taking place around the world, not just in Europe. So it's good that at least the DSA is trying to move things forward by giving it a, a legislative basis in, in one jurisdiction at least. And But of course, as with, with many aspects of the DSA, um, this is a good start, but of course, there's a lot more that still needs to be done. And at Mozilla, when we think about these provisions, three things come to mind where we think a little bit more work needs to be done. Uh, firstly, the auditing regime needs to be granular in nature. At the moment, the DSA simply specifies that an audit must take place, but it doesn't really give much clarity into how that audit should be conducted and what kind of specific elements need to be included in that process. And so for us, a big step forward was to be get, would to be to get a lot more granular into what that, uh, that regime should look like. Secondly, the issue about standardization and certification. Like as, as we know, this third party platform auditing is very much an emergent nascent, nascent industry, and we don't yet have good international standards or certified bodies to, to kind of manage it and to give it a kind of a, a strong degree of credibility. And so solving for that, whether it's through the DSA or through whatever comes next in delegated and, and acts and so forth is gonna be crucial for the EU for this regime to be, um, to be impactful. And then finally, the question about auditing the auditors. Like in the sectors where auditing works, or at least in those where it fails better, there tends to be a structural misalignment of incentives that the auditor knows they need to do a good job or else they might get sued by somebody who's upset by their, by their outcomes. And in the DSA, the draft text at least, that kind of structural misalignment is not built into the system. So exploring how that could be, could be improved would be, a, would be a really interesting work stream to pursue. And now, of course, given the sheer novelty of this, this issue space, there's so much more that could be unpacked and that's just a small flavor of the potential issues. And of course, it's important that we give space for some of this expert led and kind of critical engagement with how the tech should be should be improved. And obviously, we've, uh, we've assembled what we think is a, a stellar panel to help us through that process. And so I think now is the time to, to give them the floor to to help us on this this journey. So with that, Jen, I, I hand back to you. Thanks, Owen, you've definitely uh, set out uh, at least the in broad strokes what's in the Mozilla position paper on auditing, which is, is why we're actually having a look at this today. And we are, of course, delighted to have joining us Alexandra Gis, MEP, who is the IMCO DSA shadow rapporteur, uh, who obviously has been following this very closely, knows a lot about it from all angles of the DSA, but we're going to try and stick to auditing today. Uh, joining us from across the pond, uh, Deborah Raji, who is a Mozilla Fellow and Research Collaborator with Algorithmic Justice League. Deborah, thank you so much for uh, allowing us all to lie in this morning because we've, uh, we've changed the time. And obviously, last but not least, our token male on the panel, Dr. Ben Wagner, who is Assistant Professor at the Faculty of Technology Policy and Management at TU Delft. And lovely to have you all with us. 
as Owen mentioned, we're going to give you a minute to set out your stall and just provide an introduction to what you think and why you think it's important. And I will remind attendees, there was a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Use it, please do click on it and ask questions or even make comments. And I will try and direct those to the panel so we get through everyone's thoughts in the next hour. Alexandra, I will let you start so the floor is yours. That is an honor. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And thank you very much uh, to Mozilla for having me and especially for discussing this topic, because my impression was in the beginning that Article 28 sort of um, nobody was really focusing on it. So I'm, I'm really delighted to, to see this. Um, I think what article, I think it's quite stunning that the commission should suggest this article and comes back to saying, oh, we have these independent audits. And when you ask the commission who is supposed to do the independent audits, they just go blank. And they say, well, actually, we don't know. Um, and then when you really insist, they say, well, there's going to be a market for it. We expect a market to be there. And then maybe the big four, the auditing companies who are specialized on financial auditing, which is something completely different from auditing algorithm systems, as we all know. And I think what is being totally ignored here is um, beyond the, the questions of, um, of methodology, what exactly are you auditing? What are you looking for? What, is, what are your goals? Is the issue of power relations. Because the, the huge majority of people who, now, who would know how to analyze this kind of data, how to work with algorithmic systems, and also have some knowledge, knowledge on how society works, how bias works, how democracy works, work for big tech. I mean, those are the companies where you can make a living with that kind of knowledge. And therefore, I am really would like to start out really with that, with that doubt. How are you going to deal with these power relations? Any independent um, auditing, a private auditing body, a notified body would have to rely heavily on recruiting people who formerly worked for big tech and who might want to go back there in their future life. So I think the issue of, of revolving doors is really, is really huge. Um, there is an issue of, um, of scale because you can't just say, well, we find some NGO who's going to process all that data. That's not, not a real option. Um, there's academia, but even academia really doesn't have the processing capacities you would need to in order to be able to look at raw data and interpret it. And then we know um, that a lot of um, academia experts are somehow reliant on funding by Google, Facebook, and whoever you know we want to mention here. Um, and so be before we really go into the, the more technicalities, if I can say that with this, <laughs> this term, um, which, which are absolutely important. I think this is really the big issue we need to face here. And what we need to solve this, I think, is a European agency. It's a public oversight body that is really able to specialize in, in, this, in this aspect and to attract professionals who know they can stay there for a long time and really specialize in auditing. Um, is it therefore very, very specialized staff who can be offered a lifelong career almost, or at least some, some safety for, for their lives. And that could at least um, provide advice to the commission, but better to have really um, the possibilities to, to really conduct those audits and take decisions. So that would be my first take. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you've raised a lot of the points that we're going to really get into, obviously. Um, Deborah, let me come to you. I mean, you're you're not based in Europe, and, and we're talking about this potential marketplace for for auditing these very large platforms. Um, is that going to be a global marketplace? I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, I was actually just thinking that when Alexandra was making her comments, um, uh, and I apologize in advance. A lot of my comments will be very US, US Canada um, specific, but there is there is this emerging community of um, researchers involved in the auditing practice. And, um, you know, Article 31, um, which is sort of related in certain ways to Article 28, goes into sort of the assumptions that uh, clearly pervade a, a lot of the policy community around who is doing this auditing work. I think there's a lot of assumptions around um, academic researchers being sort of the dominant auditing um, you know, participants, but there's definitely a lot of 
a great sort of investigative journalist like the markup. Um, there's, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, lobbying groups and, um, you know, uh, law firms that have sort of technical auditing capacity. Uh, there's, uh, you know, consultancies like Orca and Upturn. Um, there's, uh, you know, civil society orgs like AJL and the ACLU that we, you know, we have the in-house sort of technical capacity people within civil society that are participating in this auditing work. So there, it is definitely not um, a mature industry. Um, you know, the assumptions around uh, standardization and certification and training programs is definitely not there. I don't know if there's a current player in this space that has the capacity to audit Facebook, for example, <laughs> that would be like, you know, a, an eight hour a day all year event for them to audit a company of that size. Um, but I do think that there's definitely an emerging community and that community definitely um, uh, you know, involves a scope of participants beyond what I think people usually realize. Um, so I think that's maybe the first point is that there, there definitely is a community and that community is international to some degree as well. Um, you know, you definitely have Article 19, Ava Lovelance, there's there's definitely AWO, a uh, Foxglove, you know, there's a lot of great, uh, uh, you know, civil society orgs and, uh, you know, law firms specialized in terms of uh, accountability for algorithmic systems and, uh, and, and technical companies sort of holding these technical, uh, these tech, uh, these tech companies accountable that 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 have that in house technical capacity. Uh, even the ACLU and sort of the equivalencies in, in the in the EU um, have uh, sort of technologists and are sort of hiring tech fellows that that have this this technical capacity to audit. So I wouldn't underestimate the ability of you know some of these uh, participants to engage in that auditing work. I, I do think that the field is non-standardized, um, but um, uh, there's definitely a lot of potential there, especially if, um, as mentioned, you know, there's incentive for that market to develop. Um, I, one of my um, sort of challenges with um, the current version of Article 28 actually goes, uh, you know, is, is, is connected to what um, Alexandra mentioned around revolving doors and, uh, you know, vetting independence, uh, you know, because there is no certification board, there is no, um, you know, standards body for, uh, you know, what constitutes a valid auditing organization. There's a lot of uh, kind of potential for reckless behavior and a, a lot of potential for conflict of interest. You know, anyone can declare themselves an auditor today and then go for, go work for the company they audited the next day. And there's no sort of mechanism for consequence in, in, in that kind of situation. And I, th I find that very uh, disturbing and very difficult. And the analogy I sort of see in my mind is, um, uh, I'm not sure if this is how it works in uh, the EU, but in Canada um, and the US, um, you know, the way that regulatory frameworks work for uh, the biomedical device industry is that they have a set of sort of, uh, you know, the government has a man, you know, uh, in our case, Health Canada in the US, it's FDA, but they'll mandate that, you know, if you want to deploy your biomedical device in the market, uh, you have to get it audited. And they just mandate that you get it audited by a set of approved auditing organizations. And those auditing organizations have to go through a certification process and the government sort of appoints a set of auditing organizations. And there's a marketplace involved there as well, where you know the company can choose any of these certified auditing organizations. Uh, they can pick you know, who they who gets to audit them based off of this market of sort of uh, certified bodies. The challenge there is that, you know, you have certain companies where they, they'll have a consultancy arm where they'll do a pre-audit <laughs> where they'll come in and you, you pay an extra fee and they'll do this pre-audit where they'll tell you everything that you're doing wrong. And they'll come in and they, they'll do the actual audit and then just certify you. And there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, dynamics involved in that industry right now, at least in Canada, where people are really questioning you know, the independence of these auditing organizations and the incentives of, you know, why would an audit organization actually have an incentive to really truly contradict, you know, what is in the best interest of this company. And I feel like with, you know, with um, online platforms and with, um, you know, some of the technologies we're talking about uh, that would sort of qualify to be audited under the DSA, that can become quite uh, dangerous and quite difficult if the auditing organization cannot be independent enough to truly cr critique that company and truly challenge that company. Um, so yeah, you know, lots of feelings and emotions about, you know, what this marketplace can look like, but there's, 
versions of this that already exist and challenges involved in, um, in implementing something like this. You know, that being said, it's incredibly difficult also for the government to have that technical capacity and develop that technical capacity internally. Um, I think it is possible for, uh, you know, the government to attract technologists to work for them. Um, but uh, in terms of just, you know, the, the attraction of working for the government versus working for this big tech company, um, I'm not sure if that dynamic is always going to be in favor of the best technologists wanting to work on these kind of problems. So there is definitely a lot of challenges that will happen if, you know, recruitment is tied to, you know, a government job or a government entity that might not be able to have the knowledge to, um, you know, foster the talent or retain the talent that's required to, you know, design and execute some of these audits. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll end there. But <laughs> yeah, lots of lots of thoughts. I, I lots of thoughts around sort of how this marketplace could develop and um, analogies, um, especially from the sort of biomedical device industry. Um, let me turn now. Uh, thank you, Deborah. Uh, let me turn to Ben. I know uh, you've written a policy paper on uh, transparency and disinformation with regard to auditing. Um, feel free to share that in the chat for our uh, our attendees as well. But Ben, give us your thoughts I mean you know uh, Alexandra commented that you know sometimes academia is hand in glove with some of the big tech companies I'm sure that's not you but do tell me why I think it's a very significant problem and I agree with basically everything that's been said before by the two wonderful panelists ahead of me I think the the challenge we face now is to really work out how this could work while first perhaps acknowledging that six months ago, we weren't even to be able to have a conversation about audits. And for many years, civil society, researchers, different uh, international organizations, members of parliament have all been screaming about the abusive practices of large tech companies and how the data that they are providing in their transparency report, the information they are providing to the public is false, is incorrect, is misleading, and is manipulative. And that we are now able to have a conversation about audits is because this proposal is on the table. So first of all, it's very exciting that we're able to talk about audits. And as you mentioned, we put together this, this policy paper which tries to tackle some of those issues and challenges. As has been mentioned already, I don't want to go into too much detail because you've already discussed it and mentioned all of the key elements, but capture is a big aspect both in academia and elsewhere. The, the thought of a university that is being funded by Google also doing these audits is completely crazy in the same way that the conflict of interest rules apply both to organizations and individuals. So we can't assume unless these individuals have some kind of long-term protection, but also some kind of long-term requirement not to work for the companies they're auditing or in similar industries, that these people will be able to do audits in an effective manner. Now, if we add on top of that, what I think we can claim is an ongoing crisis in the existing auditing industry in the first place, which is that the auditors themselves are picked by the companies that are going to be auditing them. You can ask a little bit whether the big four or existing financial auditors might be the right choice, simply because we've seen from numerous financial scandals in the past decade that they perhaps aren't the ideal choices. And they have numerous problems of capture, of power imbalances that we've already discussed. And the real challenges are difficult to bring out in the context of audit relationships and over many years. And in the cases of many of the abuses of power that we see in the context of the technologies that we're talking about right now, we are not able to wait for years for auditors to work this out. We need solutions in the next months, in the next weeks, in the next years, as soon as possible. So I think, and I fully agree with Alexandra here, I think that uh, a public sector regulator doing the audits is a much better way to go. But I would also try to agree with Deborah in the sense that she's saying there are numerous civil society groups empowered to be able to be part of that process. The main thing is that the choice of who does the regulation in the sense of who does the audits, shouldn't be a marketplace where the companies themselves can choose their auditor, but rather the process by which that happens takes place by a public sector body that is doing this. And they can then draw on the expertise, the uh, fantastic capacity that exists already in civil society. I would also add that the audit capacity here is extremely sensitive in the sense that they're dealing with huge amounts of really powerful data that if misused is can be misused on the scale of like uh, another Snowden leak or in the scale of another great problem for both elections and democracy. 
And so it's really, really important to get the, the mechanisms here right and that they don't sort of devolve into a mechanism for government surveillance. I don't think that's a necessary consequence, but it's certainly something to be careful of and specifically to be careful of precisely because right now the way the DSA is written, not just audits, but the regulatory model itself lacks independence. So we have a huge problem about a lack of independence, which can only be resolved by independent public regulators taking the lead, definitely involving existing capacity that's there. Deborah provided a far better list than I ever could. So there's, there's really many, many organizations that could be involved that could support this process. But I think if you don't put the public sector in the lead, if you just create a marketplace and you allow the companies to pick who's auditing them, you won't get an auditing process that really provides the accountability that we need right now at this point in time. And all of the academic research in this area, but also all of the many statements from civil society, from numerous politicians support this. There's, there's a need for change. And I don't think there's, there's strong disagreement from almost any party talking about these issues for an extended period of time, which is unusual. We don't often get to these points where everybody seems to agree that this is the way to go. So let's hope that that continues and that we can really have a serious conversation about how to do audits right. Thank you, Ben. You've dived in straight into the question of who should be doing the audits. Um, I mean, I, I initially was going to ask you all, like, why has the Commission come up with this uh, in this particular area? Because it isn't something in particular that we're necessarily used to in regards, say, we compare to data protection, we've got the regulatory DPAs. If we compare to other areas, there's, you know, we've got ANISA doing cybersecurity and so on. Um, but talking about who is doing those audits, uh, Ben, you mentioned civil society, academia and public bodies. What those three things have in common is that they are not necessarily for profit. You know, and when we talk about a marketplace, that sort of seems to me to be a, an imbalance there. We're talking about different groups of people that are going to do it. So, I mean, Alexandra, you, I, I saw answered the question on the Q&A already, but it was, it was a pertinent one. And it was about attracting the right talent to people who want these careers. And do they want to work for not-for-profits? Do they want a career based in, in, in an industry where they feel they've got opportunities and outlets? And um, if you can paraphrase what you, I know you, you wrote in the, in the text. Yeah, happy to do that. I'm sorry for answering the question too early. <laughs> Um, I, I think I think Ben Ben came up with a perfect solution. I think we we need a broad um, industry of, um, of of auditing or, or bodies um, where where talent can find their place, where people can be very innovative, maybe specialize in certain types of types of audits. You know, one organization might might go for bias audits, and the other one for certain aspects of regulatory audits or like ethic aspects. I mean, the issue is, do you audit for technicalities, for technical aspects? Is something, is there conformity with the standard or are there other risks that may not even have been considered for society? Or you could have an environmental audit, for example. What about, you know, energy consumption or something like that? So I do think we need very different kinds of organizations. But I also think, um, that we, we need a public regulator who has oversight over all these organizations and, and has the last word and can really decide, you know, which companies need to be audited by whom. And I think that the point on granularity is a very good point. Obviously, as European regulator, what, what I have mostly in mind is, I mean, how do you regulate Facebook? How do you, how do you audit Facebook? As Deborah said, that's that's really a feat. Um, but obviously, this is very different for smaller digital smaller digital services who might need audits as well. But I think in Article 28, 28 we talk mainly about about the bigger ones. So it depends a little bit on the granularity what you need. Well, I mean, as you you've brought it up, um, Tiernan and Kenny has already asked this question in the Q and A about Owen's point regarding granularity and suggests would it be better to look at including some specific audit requirements in the codes of conduct for large platforms rather than in primary or secondary education. Uh, Deborah, what, what's your thought on that? I mean, yeah, codes of conduct sound wonderful, but they lack teeth. Um, yeah, I, I find that interesting. I, I just want to also comment on a couple things that were said. Sorry, I don't want to derail the conversation too much, but um, uh, I, I definitely, so to, Pen, to Ben's point, um, you know, this is definitely a step forward, um, you know, um, you had mentioned earlier, um, you know, we already have sort of some of these, uh, you know, 
uh, impact assessment requirements, um, you know, what is different about this DSA article. And I think that, you know, as an external auditor, what we see as the opportunity with this article is the fact that, you know, one of the big challenges of auditing from the outside is this challenge of access. So, um, you know, as an internal auditor, so meaning, you know, an, an employee or maybe an internal audit team within the company, um, think of, you know, uh, Google or Facebook's internal sort of ethics team or, um, uh, you know, Accenture, one of the consultancy that they might hire to come in and, and an audit. Um, you know, in, in those cases, uh, you know, you kind of, you, you sign a contract that has very specific clauses that make it so that you can't disclose the information beyond a particular realm. Um, and you sort of represent the interests of particular stakeholders. So, um, you know, uh, the audit is sort of shaped and uh, informed by a perspective that's prioritizing, you know, shareholders maybe, um, or uh, thinking about liability and compliance and quality control. Whereas with external auditors, and mostly I'm speaking from, you know, someone working with a lot of advocacy groups, um, you know, our stakeholders are completely different. We're thinking about the affected population and, uh, you know, um, the mission statement with respect to you know how these systems affect them we don't have any restrictions we don't sign any contracts with these companies that restrict our ability to disclose to the public or um you know share whatever information we discover in the audit and i think that that definitely um makes it very difficult to access the the systems we're trying to audit so something like the dsa's article 28 and uh, like i mentioned later on like article 31 sort of provide this opportunity to actually get some in like you know maybe force a little bit of access uh inside the company by being some kind of third party you know vetted third party audit body you know perhaps we can finally get a peek under the hood to be able to truly assess these systems and um you know um uh you know i guess discover results that are relevant to the well-being of whatever stakeholders we're, we're, we're representing, which is you know, perhaps a different group than the shareholders that the internal auditors might be representing. So as a result of that, you know, depending on who the external auditor is representing, they can behave very differently and have very different methods. I think there's some, there's some um, uh, restrictions that make a lot of sense. Um, I think one of the reasons why academic institutions keep coming up is this expectation of an IRB process or um, you, you know, um, uh, an ethics review of, of like the audit procedure itself, just to make sure that it's thorough and scientifically sound. Um, the idea of peer review, um, all of these um, uh, sort of academic practices that just guarantee a certain amount of robustness and ethical research practice, like those are definitely, uh, you know, requirements that can be imposed on all third party auditors, even outside of academia, just to ensure a certain amount of thoroughness to the audit work itself. Um, and you can see, you know, uh, I bring up the markup because they're they're this investigative journalism group and they're mostly based in the US, but they 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 have a lot of great stories and they kind of hold themselves to that academic standard with respect to, you know, they will disclose uh, you know, the the raw data of their audit results. They will they will release their code in a GitHub repo. Um, they they engage in a form like an informal version of peer review and they'll list their reviewers. So these are practices that they don't have to do, but they sort of do it for accountability practices and just to um, give some legitimacy to the their audit process, even though they're not necessarily academics or or regulators that might be, you know, um, required to act this way. So yeah, a code of conduct that is, you know, procedural in the sense of you know, your audit needs to be composed of step A, B, C. I think those are not helpful <laughs> because every auditor, every external auditor, especially is representing a different interest and it's going to ask different questions. So imposing a set of questions is not going to be helpful, but imposing, you know, um, and, you know, in research integrity practices, uh, you know, research ethics practices, I think is totally within the realm of something that can be useful. And then I personally have a stance towards, um, you know, uh, requiring a certain amount of disclosure, public disclosure uh, of the audit results or transparency around the audit process um, for the public to be able to see for themselves, you know, what actually went into the audit and what the results were. Um, and, you know, of course, that's something that's very difficult to get companies to agree to. <laughs> so um, uh, that's, that's, you know, it's definitely something that's been, when I read the DSA, that's something I 
I notice immediately as missing is any kind of disclosure requirement to the public. Um, or even, uh, you know, there's, it's unclear how much needs to be disclosed to even regulators or how much needs to be transparent to regulators as to the details of the audit process and the audit results. So that's definitely something that can be this external sort of accountability mechanism that's not necessarily present in the current draft. Thank you. I, I mean, I'm taken by your, your comments on the, the investment of journalism organizing. I'm old enough to remember a time when trust and ethics were enough and we didn't have to necessarily expose <laughs> everything and, and, and show quite that granularity, not that granularity is in transparency, it's a bad thing. Then um, one of the things that you mentioned in your, in your last uh, intervention was that we can't wait around for this, we need this now. Um, and I'm struck a little by what I listened to Deborah talking about academic principles and ethics and checking and it, that takes time. I mean, thoroughness takes time. And, and, you know, one of the mantras of one of the B's platforms we're even thinking about was move fast and break things. They move faster than the auditors can. Do you think, particularly in the tech world, that it's going to be a problem? I mean, we see auditing as a marketplace is quite mature with regard to finance and financial institutions who don't necessarily move at the speed of light. So I think it's definitely a challenge, but I don't think it's an insurmountable one, especially if you acknowledge that we're not talking about dealing with the fast, agile, small startups. We're talking about the large monopolistic or oligopolistic companies that are already extremely powerful and are often using that power for market dominance. So when you're looking at those companies and when they have considerable effects on society, I think that they already extract sufficient rents from those societies. There's no reason that they can't give back a little in the terms of sort of regulatory capacity. And just to sort of, because there's been different things mentioned about uh, academia, and I'm certainly not able to speak for the whole of academia, but uh, at least in my impression so far, I'm not sure that academia has the right incentives to be the auditor in this case. And it needs to be individuals and organizations that are specifically set up for the purpose of auditing. And that would be better in the public sector than in the private sector, again. And the, the challenges that we, we are looking at now in how to sort of regulate do pose the danger as they have with either private, similar privacy regulations that you create a set of companies able to respond to these auditing requirements that is exclusive. So it becomes difficult to become as large as Facebook or as Google because they are the only companies who are able to go through this auditing process. And that is a challenge. I don't think it's an insurmountable one, but it's certainly a challenge on how to design this in a way that it's still possible to engage in audits without limiting the, the scale of the companies able to comply with it to a select few. And I would also add that in that context, it's not just about thinking about innovation and development and opportunity, but just to acknowledge that right now, the existing regulatory frameworks and the existing regulators aren't able to actually understand what these platforms are doing. So in the, the model that we propose, it's not so much linked to the DSA directly, it is inspired or linked, uh, it has uh, many references to the DSA, but what we're actually suggesting is that even regulators with technical capacity lacking should still be able to ask a question of a platform and get an answer that is not just an ad hoc answer, but an answer that somebody else has checked. And that would plausibly also apply to a set of civil society groups who could then also go and say, I have this done this really important research. Can you confirm to me that this is actually happening? Or can you give me a verified statement that this is not true? And this, again, I don't think it can necessarily apply to every single citizen in the world, but truthful statements are, I think, the minimum we should be able to expect from these platforms. And it sort of draws on something that I think we've learned over time uh, for many of the people working on privacy, which is that the bigger and the more powerful the actors are involved, you have to assume that the actors will be adversarial, which means that essentially you can't trust them. And so you need a mechanism to create trust. You can't assume trust by default. Well, Ben, as a follow-up question, you've mentioned several times, you know, that, that this should be sort of public bodies. How then would you see the relationship between sort of such public body auditors and the regulatory organizations, the regulatory bodies? I mean, would they simply just be another arm of that regulatory body? I mean, and, and under no circumstances. No. no, 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 no. The, that's the point. So you need a separate body that does the auditing. There are different actors which it could be attached to. So, for example, you could think about organizations that have 
a high degree of independence already, such as the European Court of Auditors, let's say, but there are also others which it could be attached to. But the key point about it is that you don't have the same regulator asking for information that is also accessing the data. And so you split those two to ensure that there's one body that is basically independent and has access to the data, but is not able to ask questions. And somebody else is able to ask questions, but doesn't have access to the data. And that way you deal with a lot of the sort of surveillance concerns and limitations in that area. Um, and while at the same time, ensuring that you don't need this very high degree of technical capacity in every single regulator that would need to be able to get responses. You have your election observers, you have your people who are responsible for managing the elections, you have your DPAs, you have your media regulators. All of these regulators have very legitimate questions to Facebook and Google and many other large tech organizations that they aren't getting answered right now. And so enabling them to get solid answers is a key mechanism that can be developed through the DSA, and I think very powerfully so. But it needs an intermediary that is probably also public to ensure that they get answers that are actually solid and trustworthy. And we've seen now so many times, like there's numerous academic publications, civil society publications, media reports, like there's a whole wealth of information how lacking in truthfulness the statements made by large platforms are. So at a certain point, you just need to stop and say, okay, this is not acceptable. This is not truthful. How can we ensure that people who are responsible for regulating are able to do that regulating? And they need some kind of truthful information as a basis of doing that, obviously. But Alexander, what do you think about this uh, model, if you like, that, that Ben is suggesting? Um, do you see any, any way it can work? It sounds complex, but complexity is not necessarily wrong, but it's just... I'm also mindful of, of timing and speed and, and also the limitations of what's actually set out in the DSA. It doesn't provide an exhaustive list of things that we need to be checking. Um, and, and that list could go on indefinitely when you think about large platforms. I mean, do we need more in the DSA that's specific and specifying what needs to be done? Um, yeah, I was, I, was, I was listening and I was actually in note-taking mode because this was, this was really interesting. So I was just already thinking about how to transform this in amendments. <laughs> but it's, it, the complexity is challenging, as you say. And I think there might be an issue, I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking aloud, um, of standardization in some form. Because um, on the one hand, I think you need a standard what kind of questions can be asked because what is in the DSA now is um, the, um, the compliance with the, the obligation set out in chapter three and with the codes of conduct. And you know, just by the way, this little bit answers also the question that was asked before on the codes of conduct. I think that was a more specific question with Deborah interpreted differently, which was a great interpretation because it was also helpful. Um, but in Europe, we have codes of conduct on, on disinformation, hate speech, and child, se child sexual material, um, but that's not exhaustive. You know, there are more obligations that need to be audited just to answer that question from the participant. Um, to come back to what Ben said, I think on the one hand, you need to do you need a legislative, you need a legal basis for the kind of questions you're allowed to ask, because otherwise that could be a little bit arbitrary because you could answer ask one, one platform one question and another platform another question, and that might be some sort of discrimination. So why are you asking Facebook to, I don't know, do fact checking and you don't ask Twitter to do it, or just, just as an example, they both do it, but um, on the other hand, that's exactly the kind of flexibility you would like to have, because obviously the very large online platforms are very different in nature one from another. Um, and I, I still don't know how to solve that exactly. I think what Ben said was a very good hint um, to take up questions asked by different kinds of regulatory authorities, even, even in the member states. and that this public European body would need to make sure that, the, that the, the questions are asked the right way and the answers are truthful or at least checked against some other kind of evidence. So the public regulator on a European level could say, well, this is the answer we got, but we don't believe this is right because we have other kind of evidence and that would, you know, then we, have, we would have a procedure for that. I, I, I think we don't need to be afraid of complexity. The world is complex. And I think what we're really facing is that we are living in, in democratic societies with constitutions that 
are, were great in, in the 1940s, in late 40s and 50s, but they absolutely couldn't foresee what is going on now, the kind of globalization of information we have and the kind of, so we need to come up with new solutions that make sure we can, we can preserve these democracies and the spirit of those constitutions. And that is necessarily complex. Um, in terms of speed, um, well, I think it depends on what Ben said. We know you get a, you, you get a question from a regulatory authority and then you get an answer and that does, takes more than a few weeks, definitely. But that's the time we need to do thorough work. I mean, I think that's the burden of democracy, but it's also the fact that yeah, then you do things in a thorough way and you find a consensus. And I think it's important to take that time. Thinking about this complexity, and, I'm, and I'm, it's really only occurring to me as I'm, as I'm listening to you speak, is, is there any way that the recent AI proposals that have taken a risk-based approach might somehow be allowed to put into a model that will allow flexibility depending on where you see the risks with each particular platform. I mean, Alexander, as you said, you don't ask the same thing of every platform, but maybe you form some sort of a pyramid of risk for each platform. Well, I would, I would need to think about that. I think the AI proposal really is not up to the task because the AI proposal treats artificial intelligence applications and context as if there were can openers. You know, that just have the same standard. It's just a technical standard. It's a CE standard to make sure, you know, that the toys you buy for your child are safe. And it just completely ignores all the societal concerns around AI. Um, so, notified bodies have to check whether the AI applications, um, you know, they have to go through these conformity assessments. But I, I, I just don't think it's enough because as long as the technical specifications are sort of fulfilled or the technical obligations, you get that conformity assessment and the big questions are not asked. So I, I don't think that's particularly inspiring. I thought it was in the beginning when I read it the first time, I thought, oh, this is great for the DSA. And then I realized I, I don't think it is. I think their article 26 might be, might be uh, more interesting when where the risk assessments are defined. I mean, that's something to work on because there are more questions asked. I think that's important to have that openness to ask the big questions about democracy, about the environment, about bias. And I'm not really seeing that in the AI proposal. Well, I don't mean to get us off track because we're talking about DSA today, but I was just, I saw some parallels that might be worth exploring. Yeah, but we have a question from an anonymous attendee um, asking how to, specifically for you, asking how do we ensure that auditors can meaningfully scrutinize very large platforms given their sheer size and complexity of business practices? Will companies not simply engage in data dump practices that issue analysis? Um, I mean, I think I can guess your answer, but uh... Uh, yes, <laughs> they do that a lot. Um, I, I just have to, sorry, I just have to react to some of what has been said before. Um, uh, uh, just speaking from experience, I guess, as a uh, as someone that's played the role of an external auditor through HAL, um, and we've audited, you know, IBM and uh, and Microsoft and Amazon products. And I just want to comment on speed, which is, a um, I, I do think these companies, people over, uh, so on one hand, yes, these are very large companies um, for the entire company to make a decision, especially a legal liability related decision will, will take a longer time. Um, but the AI machine learning groups at these companies are actually quite small. Uh, Amazon's AWS um, facial recognition team was less than 20 people. Um, and they were building products that were deployed on, you know, um, 10, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, if not through their ring product, uh, you know, now they're partnered with, you know, 400 police departments affecting who knows how many people. So at Google, you know, their, their, their product teams around machine learning products that are affecting, you know, millions, uh, tens of millions of users are, are very small. So I wouldn't underestimate uh, the ability of some of these companies to move quickly. Um, once we audited the facial recognition products of these big companies, you know, they made their updates within seven months. So um, I just wanted to comment on that. I, I, I just want to make sure that there's clarity around the fact that, yeah, although these are very large companies, uh, often in terms of like, you know, who, how large is the team at Facebook working on 
these recommendation systems that are, you know, shaping the newsfeed or Twitter, who's working on moderation. It could be large teams or it could be quite small teams. Um, that's not always necessarily clear. Um, I just wanted to make that as a comment and then also comment on Ben's point around, you know, having different regulatory agencies in charge of collecting data and then another sort of regulatory agency to ask questions about that data. Um, I do think that there definitely should be regulatory oversight of auditors. There definitely should be a regulatory agency collecting data. Um, but the value of having external auditors being the ones to ask the questions is that they represent very specific communities. So you have, you know, groups like Data for Black Lives representing the interests of, you know, African Americans um, or, you know, uh, different, there's a, there's a, there's an advocacy group that represents the interests of those that are going through the immigration process. And they have a completely different set of questions that regulators will not think to ask about um, the system itself. So including and providing access to these external auditors, particularly advocacy groups, um, kind of opens things up where each community now has an opportunity to ask the questions that are relevant to their own community. Um, and that's a really important contribution of external auditors in general to the space. Um, I just wanted to make those comments, sorry, <laughs> um, before digging into the question that you asked, um, which is, yeah, do, do kind of, do auditors get overwhelmed with sort of these data dumps? Uh, I actually think there's, uh, in the DSA, there, in the DSA article draft, there's a lot of opportunity for the, off, the sort of frequent excuse you get when you demand for information is, uh, you know, trade secrets, um, or privacy, and those two excuses are sort of uh, viable, uh, you know, uh, loopholes and backdoors that you know are mentioned in the DSA as uh, valid excuses for a company not to provide information. So I think that that's already, um, you know, something that you notice right away reading the article is that um, yeah, a company can claim that um, you know for privacy reasons or trade secret reasons they won't share information at all, or when they do share information, they don't share, and this happens more often than not, uh, they don't share sort of the data dictionary or, um, you know, every, so everything is sort of, uh, you know, uh, you might have all these uh, symbols and acronyms and none of it actually defined in a meaningful way. Or, um, and this happens often if you demand for access to a code base, um, they'll share the code, but then they will remove the, um, you know, the, the parts of the code that they see as sort of proprietary technology and thus you can't actually run the code um, uh, or you can't actually read the code because it's not well commented and there's not information available there. Um, so that definitely um, does happen as well where, uh, you know, just having access to all the information in, in a disorganized way is not helpful. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if that was the question um, that was asked around um, the data dumps. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I said a lot of things at once. <laughs> you know, and it was just a question came in at exactly the same time as you were wrapping up there. And it's, um, okay. It is an interesting one um, regarding advocacy groups in Poland and Hungary who are looking, want to see how platforms are suppressing anti-abortion content for instance. Um, and how do you prevent those groups from getting access to data or should they have the same right to demand such access? Does this boil down to the question of who is a legitimate NGO? I mean, I suppose you 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 know you can't really, you know you mentioned different rights based yeah. groups, uh, so perhaps that's that's one. I mean, briefly before because we are running out of time. What's yeah. your take on that? Yeah, I, I like I mentioned, I I agree with Alexandra. There should be regulatory oversight over um, you know uh, who gets to call themselves an auditor, um, and uh, there should definitely be you know um, uh, uh, an understanding or. Um, a set a bar set by by the government as to who's sort of a qualified uh, auditor that can have that can demand that access. Um, and you know, in terms of like representing particular interests and particular you know political objectives, I do think that there be, there does need to be a the current situation at the moment is that these companies are so closed off or. Um, you know, the information that they provide uh, is so inaccessible uh, that if I as a citizen or, you know, I as a sort of member of a community group or an advocacy group have, you know, important questions related to my community uh, in which, you know, I'm affected by this technology and I have questions about, you know, exactly how that technology affects me, or I want to investigate that the, the perceived impact of this technology in my own life, um, I don't have avenues or 
access to opportunities to, to voice this concern and be taken seriously. Um, and I don't have avenues or access to opportunities to actually investigate that or audit that myself or you know, contribute to an audit of that, of that sort. So I do think that there's definitely um, value in giving you know, regular citizens the opportunity to either, you know, communicate with their advocacy group, with their, their sort of related advocacy group and have, you know, some level of participation in the audit process. I think if regulators are the only ones coming up with questions, uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, relevant questions that won't necessarily be asked of these companies. Um, so I think that's sort of my stance on that. And, and with respect to, you know, how valid that organizational objective is, um, you know, how it might, how the, the, the sort of advocacy group may or may not represent, you know, particular political positions or uh, particular interests. Um, I think that that's up to the regulator to sort of decide which advocacy groups or which auditors, um, you know, should have that opportunity to investigate or to ask these questions of these companies. Um, but ultimately it plays down to the fact that if the regulators are coming up with these questions on their own, they're gonna miss important questions. Um, I don't think every, com every, you know, every advocacy group should have access to that information directly, but I definitely think that there should be an opportunity given to external auditors to make to, to make those demands, to sort of put in that FOIA request. In the same way that you can have journalists from any kind of publication, um, you know, make that request um, uh, to access public information, uh, I do think that there's, uh, you know, there should be that level of um, access or transparency granted to uh, external auditing or uh, bodies or uh, sort of external auditor organizations and advocacy groups. Well, you've raised some challenges there and provided some, I think, good potential solutions. Um, as we are sort of for the last five minutes, Ben, let me go to you. Uh, you know how the sausage is made here in Brussels. We're at the amendment stage. Everyone's having a look at this. Um, what would you want to see added in or taken out or elaborated on in, uh, in the recitals of Vida, as it may, in, in, in the article um, in the DSA? What, what's your, you know, call at this point well it's not like there's anybody here who would be possible or really able to submit those amendments right so like that does of course make things a lot easier when we're in that situation i think i i'm not so well versed in brussels legal language that i would uh, like say this specific wording or these exact words need to be in place i think that it's more amendments that would need to take place which just carry the spirit of the conversation that we've just had and to make sure that the, the, the mechanisms that are in place and that the, the procedures that are in place respond to capture, respond to conflict of interest, respond to the challenges associated with uh, a private or public sector marketplace potentially or lack of a marketplace being chosen. And I really think there's potential there to, you mentioned beforehand the sort of the AI regulation and how it sort of, it took a path towards, let's say a slightly more limited perspective on that. And uh, I think that there's still the potential for the DSA to be something bigger and to really be like this, this potential GDPR for speech, which is really the basic framework where we have a set of rules and regulations that are far more general. One thing that I think is important because we were discussed a bit in the context of complexity and uh, just to mention again, I think the, the statements made here in the report published by Benoit Loutrel is extremely helpful from 2019, where he basically is a former French regulator essentially saying that the, the companies are so evasive in how they provide you information that you constantly need to be able to ask them different questions again and again. And you can't just fix a set of questions in legislation and then expect that those questions will work. And just also to completely agree with what Deborah said, I think it's very valid. Um, I was trying to suggest perhaps that some civil society groups or some organizations who ask questions might not have the technical capacity and so might want just the answer rather than the data. But I don't think that should preclude organizations from being able to find out themselves because that is a like a an increasingly important dimension of if you're affected by this and have the technical capacity why should that be impossible again with all of the difficulties and limitations and restrictions of you need a process for that that makes it safe and secure and that creates accountability and avoids capture but i think that the this is really not a question that should be posed to me but to alexandra because she's in a far better position to write the right amendments and to really influence this in a positive direction 
Well, then I am going to put that to Alexandra now. So, I mean, you, you were in note taking mode, you're in amendment drafting mode at this point, I suppose. What are your takeaways then from this? We, we can't solve it in one hour, but we have had a pretty good stab at getting to the main points today. Yes, sort of everything, actually, as I said, I'm really in note taking mode. So I was, I was, I was happy for, about the question because I was expecting now Ben to enumerate the amendments and I was just supposed to take note and table them. Um, well, not going to happen, I know. Um, yeah, I think the, the idea of um, having a public re regulator and then uh, a flourishing, hopefully, industry of different kind of auditing bodies is, is very interesting. Um, where the, the public regulator is going into a different article, I suppose, because there's this very complicated oversight architecture, and I would have to look at that. I mean, we, we are looking into that again um, already, and it needs to be somehow interconnected, obviously. Um, definitely this issue of who asked the questions and who has access to the data. This is something that I hadn't come up with, I have to admit. So that's very interesting. And I think Deborah's point on, on advocacy groups being able to ask the questions is really, really important because this is something that's completely missing from the DSA and it's completely missing from the AI regulation. And I've really been looking for, for a solution, how to bring that back in. So I think that's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, also, the issue, what, what is still unsolved, um, I think, is the issue of the, you know, what we call in you know, the Polish or Hungarian issue, you know, NGOs or somehow government funded NGOs asking questions to game the system, right, and, and to take off abortion content and stuff like that. That's really, I'm, I'm not sure, because that's obviously a very, very political choice to make for a regulator. And that, that's still difficult. Um, if anybody has any input, <laughs> we're grateful just to come to us. We are in, in amendment writing mode and I think we will, we will get back to experts and certainly to, to Ben who we're already in, always in, already in touch with and I would be very happy to talk to Deborah as well to, to look into this further. But this was, this was extremely helpful for my work. So thank you so much for that. And, and thank you, Alexandra. It's wonderful to, you know, it is good to have someone on these discussions who is in the position you're in to be able to actually say, well, we're looking at doing this. And so uh, people can feel that they've actually been heard with these concerns. And uh, um, I mentioned the sausage making machine. We know how it goes with these laws. You put an awful lot in and it's, it's sometimes not clear to people on the outside how amendments get drafted and how, and how concerns are raised. And this is only our second Mozilla Mornings uh, of 2021. Um, I am sure there will be more. I am sure we'll be looking and picking apart the DSA in other articles and other concerns as we go along. So thank you so much, uh, all of you for, for joining us. Thank you to the attendees for uh, your questions and your interest. And thank you very much to Mozilla for organizing it. Have a lovely day. And remember, keep the conversation going on social media or between yourselves, we, we will share that, the, you know, I know Alexander, your email's up there and we, we can put the contents out as, uh, as well after this event. So have a great day and thank you for all your hard work. Thank you, all the best. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.